Welcome everyone to today's live from Cleveland Clinic broadcast. And I also wanted to thank you. Thank you to over 1200 healthcare providers who have registered for today's event from across the globe, representing 96 countries. We want to keep this program as interactive as possible. So we encourage you to use the chat box to send your comments and questions during the broadcast. And I'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can either right after each of the talks or towards the end of the program. We do want to acknowledge our uh, industry sponsors that are listed on this slide, including Cook Medical, Janssen, Medtronics, and Olympus. Now I'd like to introduce our esteemed faculty, myself and Dr. Michelle Kim, who's the chief of uh, the GI Hepatology Nutrition uh, division at Cleveland Clinic. I serve as the directors. We have th three esteemed faculty that will be giving uh, talks tonight, including um, Scott, Gabbard, Scott Gabbard, Samita Garg, and Matthew Hoshites. So we're really looking forward to an exciting uh, talk uh, this evening. And we'll be focusing on motility disorders. And without further ado, we're going to step right into our first discussion by uh, Samita Garg, who's going to talk to us about irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. Samita, I'll leave, let you take it from here. Thanks, Tony, for that nice introduction. Um, the first topic will be irritable bowel syndrome. The focus will be constipation, and we'll um, round out the discussion at the end with irritable bowel syndrome focused on um, diarrhea predominant sy symptoms. Next slide. So IBS is um, really made by, um, it's a symptom-based diagnosis made by the Rome 4 criteria, as you can see if you click again, by our Rome 4 um, uh, criteria that are defined by pain and altered bowel habits with a diagnosis made at least six months prior to presentation. The diagnostic evaluation really begins with uh, making sure that the patient is up to date on uh, screening uh, colonoscopy basic labs like CBC, TSH, and then again by a uh, symptom based um, diagnosis uh, based on the Rome 4 criteria and really making a confident uh, diagnosis, providing reassurance and explanation to the patient. There are multiple factors that have been uh, thought to be associated with IBS, including post-infectious IBS, pre- and postnatal factors, but really the main sort of underlying cause or pathogenesis of IBS is the gut-brain uh, dysfunction. Next slide. So as this outlines, uh, really the way we define and think about IBS is a disorder of the gut-brain interaction with pain as a predominant symptom and involvement of uh, multiple components of the brain-gut axis. And uh, these two figures kind of show the different factors, including hormonal factors and uh, different um, uh, uh, excitatory receptors and channels that are involved in the brain-gut axis. Next slide. So that brings us to some of the treatments uh, that we use for IBS, both for IBS with diarrhea, and the focus of this is IBS with constipation, but really we use neuromodulators for pain. And one of the main neuromodulators that we use are uh, tricyclic antidepressants. There, are, there is some good evidence for this. Um, also, uh, we use SNRIs like duloxetine. There's some good evidence based on efficacy in fibromyalgia and headaches. As SRIs, there's not as good evidence for abdominal pain, and partly because of the greater, um, because of side effects that outweigh the benefits. Next slide. So we use a variety of TCAs. Um, the ones that are preferred include, include the secondary amines, including disipramine and nortriptyline. Part of the reason for this is because of less sedation, less constipation associated with these. And you can see that these are highlighted. Again, these secondary amines, especially for patients with IBS-C, are preferred because of the less sedation, less constipation associated with them. Next slide. 
This is a summary slide by Drosman et al. Uh, showing the various gut brain modulators that we use to modulate pain. Again, TCAs and SNRIs are uh, used for pain. SSRIs can be used when patients have anxiety and depression um, as predominant symptoms along with some of their GI symptoms. And then a lot of times what we do is augmentation therapy. So we use low dose of multiple neuromodulators to help with various symptoms, including pain, including bloating, including nausea. Next slide. Although we use multiple medications, we also cannot forget about um, brain, uh, gut, uh, and gut-based hypnosis. We have uh, GI psychologists that work with us in our clinics to provide complementary therapy to medical therapy. Next slide. The, this next topic will also be covered in the section of IBSD. We use dietary therapies, especially for symptoms that have bloating and diarrhea. This diet called the low FODMAP diet was discovered um, 20 years ago now. They're celebrating their 20th anniversary by a group in Australia led by Dr. Peter Gibson. And this showed significant, this has showed over time significant improvement in IBS symptoms, especially bloating and diarrhea. This is done sequentially with uh, first restriction over a four week period, then slow reintroduction of specific items and then eventual personalization of the diet. And this is important because high FODMAPs have been uh, shown to be a cause of SIBO. Next slide. So um, this is basically the pattern that uh, we follow again, first restriction of four to eight weeks, then reintroduction, and then personalization. And we use the help of a nutritionist to really uh, personalize this diet. Next slide. These are the FODMAPs when we're talking about FODMAPs, so which are, uh, we recommend low uh, lactose, low fructose, and low gluten diet. Next slide. This is what we give to patients in a picture form to help them understand what some of the low FODMAP foods are. At the top is what to eat and at the bottom is what to avoid. Next slide. And the basic idea of these FODMAPs is that they create this osmotic overload and dysbiosis that eventually causes gas and discomfort in patients. Next slide. And to this last part um, related to constipation, we have a variety of constipation therapies, starting with over-the-counter therapies uh, and a multitude of prescription medications that I'll go over. Next slide. This is a summary slide of medications that we have available for IBSC and CIC. Uh, as you can see, they're all other than tenapinor, they're all used for both conditions. Um, different doses are used uh, for IBSC versus CIC um, uh, lubiprostone plakenotide and linaclotide, as we'll show in the next slide. There are different mechanisms. If you go to the next slide, it shows the different mechanisms of all the different medications. Linaclotide and plakenotide are both uh, guanylate cyclase C agonists. Lubiprostone is a type 2 chloride channel activator. And tenapinor uh, is the most recent medication that we use for IBSC. It is a sodium hydrogen exchange inhibitor. Next slide. As you can see, the mechanisms are highlighted there. There are different doses that we use for different conditions. Plakenotide is uh, just one dose for both CIC and IBSC. For linaclotide uh, or linzes, the higher dose is used for IBSC because we think that that helps with the pain component of IBSC. And for lubiprostone, we use the lower dose uh, for IBSC. Next slide. The main side effects that are associated with all of them include abdominal pain and diarrhea. Next slide. Tenapinor um, is, uh, is sodium channel antagonist. It's a secretagogue. 
Um, it's only indicated and approved for IBSC. It helps with both abdominal pain and constipation. And one of the plus sides of this medication is, is not associated with as much diarrhea. Next slide. So, in summary, uh, there are a multitude of medications as well as dietary therapies, specifically the low FODMAP diet for bloating symptoms and multiple medications, prescription medications, along with over-the-counter medications that are available for constipation and predominant symptoms. IBS patients oftentimes have multiple other syndromes and diagnoses. So really what we try to do at the clinic is a multidisciplinary clinic. We work with nutritionists and GS psychologists, and in certain cases with um, colorectal and urogynecology as well. Thank you. Thank you, Samita, for that uh, wonderful overview. And if I may just take a minute to ask a question. Um, you know, you brought up a lot of different treatments. There's so many options out there. And I guess I wonder if you could just sort of tell us, you know, uh, you know, do you start with one particular? Do you do diet first? Or is there, and do you ever combine medications or psychological, you know, therapies? I mean, like, give us like a, like, how, how do you approach the average patient? That's a great question. Um, so, really, it's very personalized care. So, it also depends on how the patient presents. So if one of their chief complaints is severe constipation, it really focus on the constipation. If their symptoms are, a lot of times patients have multiple symptoms. So they'll have constipation and they'll have bloating and they'll have nausea. So sometimes I might start with focusing on one or two predominant symptoms like the constipation. The nice thing with some of the medications for, for example, the linaclotide is that it helps with pain and constipation. So I may start with that and getting them on a good dietary regimen and see where that goes in four weeks. Usually I don't uh, add too many things, maybe one or two things, and then change therapy at four weeks. Right. I, I think that's great because I also use the predominant symptom to guide which type of treatment. So if pain is the predominant symptom, as you said, it could be one of the linaclotide, blocanotide, or a tricyclic, as you indicated, may help with the pain. I think it's important to, rem to to note as well that the dosing of the tricyclic is relatively low. I don't know if you can expand upon that a little bit and what and whether you think it causes significant constipation at the low doses. So that's a great point. So we found in our uh, studies that low dose is helpful for abdominal pain and is associated with less side effects, like the anticholinergic side effects. So sometimes I even use it in patients of all ages, um, genders, because it's overall well tolerated. And if they get a little mild constipation, then we'll use one of the laxatives to help with the constipation side effect. And just what the last question I'll just ask it, um, and it relates to something in the chat that says about stool softeners. Um, can you take them? So I guess one question is, do you use stool softeners? Um, and two, uh, maybe you could expand upon other laxatives. Can you use them for a long period of time? Or are you concerned about dependency with any of the laxatives? That's a great question. So the laxatives, the prescription laxatives that I focused on were maintenance therapy. So they can be used long-term for IBSC. Along with those, you can use some over-the-counter therapies like Miralax or Magnesium, which are osmotic laxatives. Colace is more of a stool softener that sometimes can be used with a stimulant laxative. Um, uh, they, they can be used for long term. Stimulants I use a little bit more sparingly, so maybe not once or twice a day, but maybe a couple times a week if they need it. But in those patients that have very severe constipation, we sometimes do do you use those regularly. So it all depends. The safest are the ones that I mentioned and the osmotic, and at least for mild constipation, using the stimulants more sparingly unless they have very severe constipation. Great, I agree. Well, thank you so much, Samita. And uh, let me introduce uh, Matt Hoshait, who's uh, one of the newer faculty members that have joined the Neurogastroenterology and Motility Group. Uh, Matt's gonna speak to us on anal rectal monometry and pelvic floor uh, dysfunction. So Matt, I'll let you take it from here. Sure. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate the introduction. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Matt Hoshite. I'm one of, like Tony said, one of the newer staff here in Cleveland. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Appreciate your time midway through your week. Uh, 
Uh, the topic I chose to present on this evening is dyssynergic defecation and anorectal manometry. Um, the reason I picked this topic is because I think it's important to recognize, as Samita alluded to at the end of her presentation, it's it's something that can be often overlooked. However, if we can identify in our patients, we can rapidly evaluate them, offer them things to get them better, and really get our patients feeling better quickly. And so that's why I wanted to talk about this this evening. So let me see if I can advance my slides. So quick case, just to get us all on the same page. I think these are patients that we probably all run into in our clinic. This is a 42-year-old female that came to our clinic with quote unquote lifelong constipation. She had said she had trouble as long as she could remember, but definitely since grade school, she spent 20 to 30 minutes on the commode multiple times a day trying to have a bowel movement. Uses enemas and digital maneuvers to remove stool from her rectum. Says that's about the one thing that works really well for her. She had seen providers in the past. She had tried and not had success with polyethylene glycol, fiber supplementation, linaclotide, placanotide. She's sticking with linaclotide. She's also taken PEG twice a day. She says when she doesn't take anything, she has very hard stools. And for this issue, she's had multiple colonoscopies over her life. Structurally, they've all been unremarkable. They've noted internal hemorrhoids multiple times. And so that kind of brings us to the, cop, uh, the topic of constipation and dyssynergic defecation. And, and it's, it's a common thing that's important to recognize. A lot of the studies that have been done looking at this estimate that about 12 to 19% of the US population is going to struggle with this. And 70% of these individuals who underwent pelvic floor physiologic testing had evidence of abnormal pelvic floor function that could be contributing to their constipation. It's important to recognize because it's common and it's not often existing in a vacuum. So it's important to realize that though you may want to explore pelvic floor testing in an individual, it's important to keep an open mind that other things can be going on at the same time. Evidence has shown that about half of people with dyssynergic defecation also have slow transit constipation of the colon. And over 70% of people with slow transit, slow transit constipation are going to have dyssynergic defecation simultaneously as well. Not only that, but people with dyssynergic defecation can have upper gut issues as well, such as functional dyspepsia, like we're gonna hear from Dr. Gabbard in a little while, and gastroparesis. And so it's important to keep an open mind and make sure we're evaluating the entire digestive system when someone comes in with these sort of concerns. And it, it takes a little bit of understanding in, to be able to explain to a patient what is normally supposed to happen when we go to the bathroom, and then also with that understanding to be able to describe to them what goes wrong in someone with pelvic floor dysfunction. And I often find it important to bring up these diagrams and show somebody in order to get them to truly understand what's going on, get buy-in, because if they understand what's going on with their pelvic floor, they're really going to understand what the therapy is going to do for them that we ultimately recommend. So the middle photo that we have here is just a, a sideways anatomic view of the pelvic floor. You can see the, the tailbone back here and the pubic bone up here. Then the three major muscles I make sure I mentioned everybody is going to be the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter along with the puborectalis, which is a sling muscle that helps us maintain continence. Now, normally when we have a bowel movement, the way I explain it to the patient is your stool is going to hit your rectum and it's going to tell your brain that something's there. And that's going to tell you to seek a bathroom to have a bowel movement. And what we do when we have a bowel movement is we contract our abdominal muscles that generates pressure higher up in the abdomen, and we relax our internal and external anal sphincters. That ultimately relaxes the puborectalis. We generate a pressure gradient of pressure up high in the abdomen, low pressure in the rectum, and stool is going to pass. Now, when we have dyssynergic defecation or pelvic floor dysfunction, there are a variety of things that can go awry, either by themselves or altogether, that can cause people to have trouble with their bowel movement. And so what that looks like is you can have abnormal perception of stool, so you may not actually sense that there's stool in the rectum, so this process never takes place. You can have abnormal coordination of the internal and external anal sphincters, so you can get what's called paradox, where instead of relaxing the external and inter internal anal sphincters, you actually tighten them up tighter, which can be an issue. Uh, you may not be flexing your abdominal muscles and pressing down as well as you should, so you lose the pressure gradient from up high, and then the puborectalis may not relax as well. 
So I know I have arrows here. These things don't necessarily occur in sequence. They can occur by themselves or all together at once and ultimately affect the way someone's able to move their bowels. So when to consider this, I think history is really the major thing that's important to recognize. So you sit down and talk with a patient and you can kind of get a beat on if this is something you need to consider. History of constipation with an incomplete workup, maybe they're not responding to other medical therapies that have been recommended. Sexual abuse has been found to be a comorbid condition in people with pelvic floor dysfunction and neurological disorders as well, like multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's are important things to note in someone's history. If they've had any surgical interventions on their pelvic floor, be a urogyne or colon, you always know, ask women about their, uh, their birth history as well, vaginal C-section and any complications therein. And then you sit down and ask them, tell me a little bit about how you go to the bathroom. It's a personal topic, but it's important. So if they have incomplete evacuation, if they're straining till they're red in the face, using enemas, using their fingers to remove stool, all of these things are important to recognize because they can ultimately say that this is something that may need to be evaluated. And we should have a low threshold to consider to do so. How do we define dyssynergic defecation? Well, like Dr. Garg said with IBS, we go to the Rome Foundation. So you need someone who meets criteria for irritable bowel syndrome with constipation or functional constipation and then has abnormalities on two of the three following tests. In the abnormal balloon expulsion test, which we'll talk about in a second, in the abnormal anorectal evacuation pattern on manometry or Impaired evacuation on imaging, something called a defecography, we're not going to have time to talk about that today, but can be very important in the evaluation of someone's bowel habits. So what is anorectal manometry? It's the gold standard, at least right now, for rectal physiology evaluation. What I tell patients is that this is an in-office test. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes. There's no sedation required. We don't bowel prep patients at our institution so they can walk in and get it done. I tell them you have to leave your dignity at the door a little bit. What we do is we have a catheter that I'll show you on the next slide that's inserted into the rectum. From there, you can gather rectal resting and squeeze pressures. You can see the pattern of relaxation on the anorectal manometry, and then you can also assess how sensitive the rectal nerves are to the presence of stool by inflating a balloon. We also do a test called a balloon expulsion test in which a balloon is inflated in the rectum and the patient's asked to expel it. We start stopwatch, we give them 60 seconds to do it. They should be able to do it under normal circumstances within 60 seconds. If they're not able to do that, that could suggest a pelvic floor pathology that's present. Here's a cartoon drawing of what that catheter looks like. Uh, this was generated from us. You can see this is a view of the external anal sphincter, internal anal sphincter in the rectum. This is the anorectal manometry catheter and there are pressure sensors along the catheter and these sensors are what's able to pick up the changes in anorectal tone during commands. It also has a balloon at the end of it that can be inflated for the balloon expulsion test and to excess sensitivity of the rectum. This is a picture of Dr. Lembo's article from 2003 that sort of shows this patient sits on a commode and they're asked to expel it within 60 seconds. This is sort of a generation of the image that we get. I think it's pretty self-explanatory what is supposed to be happening. And I show this to patients to kind of reinforce it. So this is a generation of pressure gradients, red being higher pressure, blue and green being lower pressure. This is the rectum up here. If you'd imagine the anatomic picture that we had on the last slide, you can see when someone bears down to have a bowel movement, there's pressure up high because we're flexing our abdominal muscles, but then a drop in pressure at the internal and external anal sphincter, and that is how bowel habits are supposed to progress. Dr. Rao from Georgia published a paper in 2016 noting that there are multiple different things that can go awry that can cause pelvic floor dysfunction. I'm not gonna go through all these in great detail, but I'll refer you to type one at this synergic defecation here. You can see the patient's at rest here and where they're asked to bear down, you can see that the pressure paradoxically goes up. And what's happening is the internal and external anal sphincter are contracting as opposed to relaxing. This is something that you sort of tell patients, well, if you're trying to push something against a closed orifice, that's gonna be difficult to do. And they're able to easily understand this when you show them. So what do we recommend for? We recommend something like Dr. Gard alluded to called biofeedback. This is what I call sort of advanced pelvic floor physical therapy. It's done with someone who's knowledgeable in pelvic floor physical therapy and biofeedback. 
They're going to work with the patient to coordinate abdominal and pelvic floor muscles during defecation via visual and verbal feedback. It's time intensive. You have to prepare your patients for that. Just sort of say it's akin to physical therapy for a shoulder injury or a back injury. It's very similar in that regard. We often recommend about four to six sessions, each being a couple weeks apart, and they're going to work on all these things during it. The image on the far right is taken from our American College of Gastroenterology guidelines on benign anal rectal disorders that actually walks you through what should happen. And I think some of the things that are important is that these physical therapists should be working with these patients with uh, with machinery and technology like the anorectal machine to actually show a patient, here's what happens when you bear down and we're gonna reteach you to relax those sphincters. Often we'll see patients who say I had pelvic floor physical therapy, I had some abdominal massage, and they told me to stretch my glute muscles. Unfortunately, that's not gonna be sufficient because they were lacking the biofeedback part and we think that's actually where all the benefit comes from. I always put this picture here, this is my daughter. As someone who is actively training a two-year-old to potty train as recently as 2 a.m. this morning, I always tell my patients this is not an easy thing to do. It takes time. It may take repeat sessions, but eventually, with enough time and enough practice, they are going to get it. And then patients will follow up and say, well, you're recommending physical therapy. I thought this was something that may need a procedure or a medication. How well does it actually work? And the answer is it works very well. There are a couple studies from Dr. Satish Rao and the Georgia group out of, in 2007 that looked at this. And so they put patients through three months or six sessions of biofeedback. And what they found, in the first column here, they said, well, how, what's the increase in complete spontaneous bowel movements per week? And patients went from a baseline of two, almost double that up to four. They, about 80% of these folks improved bowel satisfaction, which is pretty impressive. And then one of the things I also appreciate that they did is they said, well, these patients also have slow transit constipation. Does slow transit improve with pelvic floor physical therapy and biofeedback? And the evidence shows that it does. So patients on SITS marker studies, about 70% of them had slow transit at baseline. And with biofeedback, that number dropped 20 to 30%. And so this is something that can benefit a patient in multiple ways. Not only does it work in the short term, but it works in the long term too. The same group put out a similar study that same year or a couple of years later and said, well, what's the durability of pelvic floor physical therapy? And what they showed was that if you do the same thing as they did on the last slide, a few sessions over a few months, those effects last up to at least one year in time. They didn't look further, but at least at one year, patients who underwent feedback had an average. In this study, these patients were having one complete spontaneous bowel movement per week. One year later, they were having five, which shows, shows the durability of that. In comparing to other standard medical therapies that we recommend, biofeedback still outperforms them. These are multiple randomized controlled trials looking at biofeedback versus uh, polyethylene glycol, rectal diazepam, standard medical care, such as advising a patient to take fiber, uh, and, and walking them through breathing exercises in the office and biofeedback statistically outperformed all of those and show, it shows how important it is for patients that have dysenergic defecation. Other recommendations I think are ones we're all familiar with and I don't think these should be neglected when we're putting someone through biofeedback. Take a similar approach to slow transit constipation. There's nothing wrong with recommending laxatives for these patients. You tell them the goal with that is to liquefy the stool and overcome the pelvic floor issue, and hopefully we'll be able to wean those down as biofeedback progresses. Foot stools to enhance defecation have been reported to be beneficial. There's no randomized controlled trials, but a lot of patients will report that they're improved with them. Don't delay the need to defecate. So, Go to the bathroom when you get the urge to do so. Don't spend a lot of time on the toilet. Don't bring your cell phone. Don't bring a magazine. Spend a few minutes and avoid straining. Also, it can be beneficial to stimulate what's known as the gastrocolic reflex. So when we consume 500 calories or more, often the colon will be stimulated to have a need to have a bowel movement, and that can be advantageous to try and help these patients to move things through as well. That's all I got for you this evening. Again, I appreciate your time. I look forward to any questions that, that anyone may have. Matt, thank you so much. That was an excellent overview.
Um, if I could just ask a, a question, because a lot of our listeners, uh, they're, you know, they're throughout the world, don't have direct access to a center such as the Cleveland Clinic that does, a, you know, anorectal motility every day of the week, multiple times. What do you recommend? I mean, do you just go straight to biofeedback? What if biofeedback's not available? What, what would you suggest? Yeah, I tell patients the easiest thing is to make the diagnosis and the hardest thing is to find a good physical therapist that has familiarity with biofeedback. There's a lot of resources online, at least here in the US. There are websites that have pelvic floor providers available in their area they can reach out to and contact. Another thing that was shown to be beneficial, and this was explored during the COVID pandemic, was what about at-home pelvic floor physical therapy and biofeedback? And so patients were put through one biofeedback session with a knowledge experienced therapist, and then they were actually given an EMG to take home, much like the anorectal device that they could take home and they could practice with themselves after getting instructions from a pelvic floor physical therapist. Studies done on that showed that that was equally as effective as going into a physical therapist's office to accomplish that. And so though you may have the inconvenience of one therapy session, you have ways to get someone at home and try and improve. That's great. Uh, and I think it's important to note that with today's technology, uh, there are a number of devices that will be coming in the near future uh, where patients will be able to do it at home for relatively low cost as long as they have an iPhone. Uh, one question that came out is, uh, what is biofeedback based on? And it's kind of a broad question. I don't know if you want to take that. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll try and answer it the best I can. Biofeedback is based on the idea that there's a there's a discoordination of the pelvic floor muscles to some degree or there's hypersensitivity or a problem with the nerves and biofeedback what i tell patients in short we have to reteach you how to poop the long answer to that is when your brain is trying to tell your pelvic floor to do a certain maneuver something is going awry and you're doing something different we have to teach you to recognize what that is what that feels like and then relearn what it means to deliberately overcome that with voluntary actions. So what does it mean to me to relax the sphincter and allow stool to pass out? And that's why biofeedback is so important because you're able to learn in real time what that might look like. And then there's a lot of voluntary repetition that occurs after that until ultimately it would hopefully become an involuntary action. Great. Well, again, thank you so much. In the interest of time, we're gonna move on. We have. Scott Gabbard up next, and we're really fortunate to have Scott, uh, who is the head of the of our section. So he is our leader, um, and he has taken on a very difficult task. And I, I'm always impressed at how well he does this to talk about functional dyspepsia because it's something that's always kind of baffled me. And I think you're going to really enjoy his presentation. Uh, Scott, I'll let you go. Take it from here. Thanks, Tony. Is this coming up for everyone? Let's see. Not yet. There we go. Here we go. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Tony. Yeah, so we're going to talk about uh, functional dyspepsia. So what is dyspepsia? And, you know, I'm going to say this multiple times during the talk today. There's really um, two subsets of dyspepsia, right? So there's pain in the center of the upper abdomen, and that's the epigastric pain syndrome subset. That's really that burning, stabbing pain may or may not be related to meals. And then you've got the epigastric fullness and bloating or the postprandial distress syndrome. So that's more of the patients who get bloating and fullness. You know, I can eat half a sandwich and I get so full and bloated. And, and that's, um, again, postprandial distress subtype. Those are the, the bloaters, whereas the epigastric pain syndrome, I call those the, uh, the burners. Again, the two subtypes of dyspepsia. Um, and you may be thinking to yourself, why do I even care about dyspepsia? And this slide right here shows, hey, this is like present in about 10% of the population here in the US, a lot of green here. So uh, this is a pretty common thing and something that you probably see on a daily basis. Now in gastroenterology, we sort of have this reflexive thought that dyspepsia must mean you have an ulcer, right? So someone comes in with burning, oh, you must have an ulcer. And if you take all comers with dyspepsia, you'll find that the vast majority of those patients have a normal upper endoscopy, right? And so dyspeptic symptoms with a normal upper endoscopy equals functional dyspepsia. 
there's a huge differential and I'm not going to go through all this, but there are many things that can cause the symptom of dyspepsia, including peptic ulcer disease, H. pylori, gastroparesis, the list goes on. Here's a list of some of the major things to think about ruling out in select cases. But for the purpose of functional dyspepsia, here's how we define functional dyspepsia, right? And this comes from the Rome criteria. So functional dyspepsia, diagnostic criteria, you have to have, you know, either postprandial fullness or early satiety. Again, that's the postprandial distress, the bloaters, or the bothersome epigastric pain and burning. That's the, the patients with the burn. No evidence of structural disease, including at upper endoscopy. And we're going to talk about the role of upper endoscopy in these patients in a little bit. And again, postprandial distress, you have that postprandial fullness or early satiety, whereas the epigastric pain syndrome, they have more of the epigastric pain or burning not necessarily related to eating. It's talking about endoscopy, right? So we're in gastroenterology and you assume that, hey, everyone with dyspepsia needs an endoscopy. And that's actually not true. So this is the ACG guidelines. And when they reviewed all the literature, they found that the risk of GI malignancy, even if you have alarm symptoms in a patient under the age of 60, the risk of a malignancy is less than 1%. So interestingly, for patients under the age of 60, the ACG does not recommend an EGD to exclude malignancy because the rate of malignancy is so low. Cer certainly dyspepsia age over 60, they should go to an EGD. Under the age of 60, not so much. They recommend test and treat for H. pylori non-invasively. Um, this is one of the slides where I like to show off. Um, this actually brings me a little bit of uh, pain because Cleveland recently lost their Skyline Chili. So it's not so easy for me to get chili dogs and give myself self-induced uh, dyspepsia anymore. But when I'm talking about uh, treatment for patients, this is what you know we strive to do is allow you to eat as many chili dogs as you can handle. I'm just kidding about that. Um, this is a slide that, again, you know, I think we already saw uh, some of this from Samita Gard. But I think, you know, when we're treating functional dyspepsia, one of the things that I think is most important is discussing with the patient what is dyspepsia. You know, and really what I like to say is functional dyspepsia boils down to being a nerve disorder of the stomach and duodenum. The nerves are overly sensitive to physiologic events. Now, I know that, hey, there are going to be experts. They disagree on this. It's much more complicated than this, and I get that. But certainly, um, for the purposes of just speaking to the average patient, I tell them this is a nerve disorder. And what not to say is we don't know what functional dyspepsia is, or I've already done the scope on you. I didn't find anything. You know, go somewhere else. Please don't say that. Right? Tell your patients functional dyspepsia is a nerve disorder. And, you know, I show this slide uh, almost every day in clinic. In fact, I was in clinic just before this, and I think I showed this in four out of my nine patients this afternoon. You know, and this sort of goes through sort of the physiologic, the pathophysiology of functional dyspepsia. And, you know, again, this is more the post inflammatory post-infectious version where patients can get some sort of inflammatory event, be it stomach bug, a virus, food poisoning. You have your um, immune response, right? So eosinophils, mast cells, lymphocytes get activated. They release among many things, interleukin-5, 4, 13, among many others, right? This helps fight off the infection, fight off the toxin. However, in about 10% of the population, the downstream effect of this inflammatory cascade is it causes the nerves to misfire and you end up with nerve pains. So there are many factors at play, genetics, an inflammatory post-infectious event, you get sensitization of the visceral nerves. And then another thing, central sensitization, you know, is very common in this population. 
So step three, right? So step one, you've discussed what functionalist Pepsi is. Step two, you've told them how they got it. Step three, reassurance, right? Patients will say, does this affect my long-term survival? And the short answer is no. Here's a nice study looking at functional dyspepsia. And guess what? There's no difference in long-term survival in patients with functional dyspepsia. Actually, you could argue patients with dyspepsia here had higher survival, again, not significant compared to those without uh, dyspepsia. How do we treat this? Right, so let's, we're gonna talk about medications, neuromodulators. Now again, it's very important, don't just start someone on a TCA, explain why you're using it. And at least what I say, almost word for word, is I tell them, hey, I'm not using this because you're anxious or because you're crazy, right? We're using this medic medication because it regulates signaling chemicals in your gut, right? Serotonin, norepinephrine. I remind patients serotonin is a major neurochemical involved in anxiety and depression, 95% of the body serotonin is stored in the gut. So these medicines modulate serotonin. Of course, they're used um, on label for antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds. I'm using it to modulate nerve transmission in the gut, right? Behavioral therapies, and what I say is it really modulates the interface between the enteric nervous system and the central nervous system. Um, this slide is basically just to show I like taking pictures of myself eating random uh, large meals, right? So treatment considerations, right? Are we treating epigastric pain syndrome, pain and burning? Are we treating postprandial distress, right? What are the patient's overlapping conditions? GERD and functional heartburn, IBS, fibromyalgia, anxiety, depression, right? What medications is the patient already on? If the patient's already on numerous neuromodulators, I'm probably not gonna start an eighth neuromodulator on the patient. And then what does the patient prefer? Um, so very first, right, PP, uh, PPI, so if we've tested H. pylori is negative, most of us will start with a PPI, that's certainly um, part of the guidelines. Just to put it in perspective, number needed to treat here is six. So PPI for dyspepsia, number needed to treat is six. H2RAs can be considered, but remember, you get tachyphylaxis after a few days, they stop working. Your body gets used to them, acid levels go right back to baseline. TCAs, right? So we've already discussed neuromodulators and TCAs. Samita mentioned this. TCAs, right? Modulate serotonin and norepinephrine. Number needed to treat is three. They are incredibly helpful. When you break it down further, you will find that this really helps more of the epigastric pain syndrome patients, right? The ulcer like the burning and pain, and you see a response rate of 67% as opposed to those with the more postprandial distress syndrome, which is, it still works in 46%, it just doesn't work any better than placebo. So I would say for epigastric pain syndrome patients, TCAs would be first line therapy after the patient has tried and failed PPIs. Now, what about the bloaters, right? The postprandial distress, I, I get early satiety and bloating after a meal. That's where I tend to use buspirone. Buspirone is an agonist for the serotonin 1A receptor. It actually augments nitric oxide release in the fundus and has been shown to help relax the fundus. So I give them 10 milligrams about 15, 30 minutes before a meal. It improves gastric accommodation and it improves postprandial fullness and bloating. So buspirone would be my first line agent. I use it TID before meals. We've also published, it helps those patients with rapid gastric emptying. So the patient who you get a gastric emptying scan for bloating or dyspepsia, and it turns out that they have rapid emptying, we have used it, uh, buspirone, with some success in that population. Um, we also use mirtazapine. So mirtazapine works on the uh, HT2C receptor and the HT3 receptor. And this helps also with the postprandial distress, you know, that early satiety and nausea. But where I find mirtazapine most helpful is it helps patients regain weight and improve their nutrition. And on average, we find that it helps them regain about nine to 10 pounds. So that patient who has postprandial distress and has lost weight, if they're able to tolerate mirtazapine, they can get, regain up to like 10 pounds of weight in two months. This is very, very helpful. 
I have had patients where I've combined buspirone and mirtazapine. I don't start both of them. I'll start one and then add the other. I don't typically use mirtazapine in conjunction with the TCA. I use either or mirtazapine or TCA for patients. Let's talk a little bit about, about complementary medicines because many patients would prefer non pharmacologic therapy like a complementary medicine. And there is a STW5 or Iberogast. The European version has nine herbs. I, I believe that there's a version that just got released in the US that has, I believe, five of these herbs. At least the data for the European version 20 drops before meals did help global dyspeptic symptoms. And you can see here one bottle, 100 doses is about 30, 40 bucks online. There is a duodenal release pill, FD Guard, that's menthol and caraway oil. And it's about 70 cents per pill last I checked. That helped both EPS and postprandial distress symptoms. And patients with more severe symptoms had a greater response. So I think either Iberogast or FD Guard are very reasonable in this population. Um, this is the last picture of me, I think, with food. Again, this is this is my own home stash from Costco of uh, Frank's Red Hot. You can use uh, capsaicin, right? This is like essentially rubbing Bengay or Icy Hot on someone's stomach. You use capsaicin, it inhibits activity of the uh, nociceptive C-type fibers. And in patients, red pepper capsules, so 500 milligrams before breakfast, 1,000 milligrams before lunch and dinner, did help dyspeptic symptoms in this study. You can see within three weeks, there was significant improvement. Of course, symptoms worsen after the first day, right? You rub Bengay on something, it burns for a little bit and then goes numb. Same thing in the stomach. So this is reasonable in some patients. And like for any uh, disorder of brain gut, interaction or uh, functional disorder, behavioral therapy. Truthfully, if we had enough behavioral therapists, I would argue behavioral therapy would be first line therapy for all of our disorders. Number needed to treat is three. What our behavioral therapists have told me is it doesn't matter so much what therapy you use, it's what therapy the patient will continue to use. That's the key is that finding a therapy that the patient will continue to use on their own that is the therapy that's gonna work. So my, my tips for functional dyspepsia, you know, obviously the number one thing would be explain what dyspepsia is, take three minutes to explain it, test and treat for H. pylori. Then you wanna break it down. Don't just say the patient has functional dyspepsia, say the patient has postprandial distress syndrome, which you'd give buspirone or mirtazapine, or a patient has epigastric pain syndrome, for which I typically use amitriptyline 10 milligrams and increase. And then adjunctive therapies, behavioral therapy, if available, menthol and caraway preparation, STW5, or the uh, red pepper capsules. And with that, I'll end. Thank you, Scott. That was a superb presentation. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, and we don't have much time, but I just want to ask one question because it's, it's always of interest to me. Um, you know, for many of the patients with, with functional dyspepsia also have bowel issues, particularly constipation. I wonder if you agree with that. And secondly, do you find that their symptoms get better if you treat their constipation? Is it like how, how would you approach a patient that has both? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's a fantastic question. And, you know, again, beyond the scope of a 12 minute talk. But yes, right, there is a huge amount of overlap. And in fact, I go out of my way, especially in females, to um, really test pelvic floor function. You know, there's actually a, a recent study that looked at females with bloating as a predominant symptom. The majority did not have constipation. They all had anorectal manometry. And I believe that the number was about two thirds ended up having dyssynergic defecation. And those who went on to get biofeedback therapy, thank you, Dr. Hoshite. Um, those who went on to get biofeedback therapy and actually resolved their dys, uh, dysynergia, 
which was about 50%, almost all of them, their bloating improved. Right. So I think there is a huge overlap um, for constipation, especially pelvic floor dysfunction in females with bloating and dyspepsia. So I have an incredibly low threshold to send patients for uh, anorectal manometry. Great. Well, thank you so much. And in the interest of time, we'll move on and I will uh, discuss IBS uh, with diarrhea. So Samita gave a wonderful talk on IBS with constipation. We'll take the other uh, side of this and talk about uh, uh, diarrhea. And as she indicated, you know, IBS is such a common disorder. It's the number one diagnosis made by gastroenterologists, top 10 made by primary care uh, throughout the world, tends to involve younger people, uh, women more so than men. And the classic presentation as indicated is pain, pain and bloating associated with alteration um, and bowel habits. I do want to focus a little bit on food because you already heard about the low FODMAP diet, and I'm going to expand upon that a little bit. But just to say, you know, symptoms are frequently aggravated by food. So we spend a fair amount of time uh, talking about the different diets, and we'll spend a minute discussing that. And of course, as we with all of these disorders, there's coexisting conditions that are very common, and they sh you should be, as a clinician, should be aware of them. These are the patients that tend to have the most severe symptoms. And really, this is where you want a collaborative effort with other um, healthcare providers in treating a multitude of symptoms that a patient uh, has. This is an algorithm that comes from the Rome 4. Um, and basically, it's really nice to walk you through, and we'll just go through it quickly with regard to the diagnosis of IBS. So, first, looking for the patient that fits the symptoms of recurrent pain. This is not constant pain, not 24 7, and it has to be related to bowel function. So, you need those two things. Uh, together, and then you'll and then basically you you'll do a thorough history and physical. Make sure you look for medications that could exacerbate symptoms, psychosocial history, which can contribute, dietary history, and of course a digital rectal exam. Then we look for alarm features. And these are important. They're shown on the left hand slide. The left hand side. I won't go through them in detail, uh, but you really in the when they're present, want to do further evaluation. Otherwise, you do a very limited screening test for diarrhea. It would be fecal calprotectin if it's available, lactoferrin, or a CRP if it's not available. Then looking for a celiac disease, particularly, um, and uh, which can be very common, people with with uh, diarrhea presenting about, about to, up to 4% of people having celiac disease, Giardia antigen testing, and generally not recommended is, is general over and parasite in other stool cultures, except in the traveler that's just come back. Perhaps that might be ways to one place to do it. And then up in the future, we'll be doing more fecal bile acid testing. It's not widely available right now. And then if they, if you find none of those, you make a diagnosis of IBS, and then you subcharacterize them based on the, um, the stool consistency. So it's not frequency, and shown up above is a triangle looking at the consistency. And so basically for diarrhea, you'll be 10 more towards loose watery stools for at least 25% of the bowel movements and not having constipation for more than 25%. And this slide reviews some of the treatment, the treatment. And on the left-hand side is IBS with constipation, which Samita has done a wonderful job of reviewing. We're gonna focus on the right-hand side, but first looking up above, we start with a doctor-patient relationship, education reassurance, and lifestyle modifications, which I wanna spend a minute in dietary, and then we'll talk about the drugs going forward. But this was an interesting study that was uh, recently published looking at the role of lifestyle. And you can see on the right-hand side, the five lifestyles that were studied, never smoking, optimal sleep, rigorous activity, moderate alcohol, and high dietary quality. And you can see from the graph that although uh, that several of them were statistically significant, but when you added three or more of them together, there you had a dramatic improvement reduction in the presentation of IBS, the development of IBS symptoms in the UK biobank uh, cohort. Now, how do foods, as we talked about, foods are, are incredibly important, and we'll talk a little bit about the low FODMAP, a couple of recent studies, but remember, foods have lots of different chemicals in them. Not only do they have the osmotic effect, but they have chemicals in them. Just all you need to think about is caffeine, how that stimulates the bowel, alcohol, how it can affect the bowel. Also has mechanical effects, neuroendocrine, and pre and probiotic effects as well. 
and they all affect the microbiome, which in turn has been shown to be important in, in development of IBS. And then there are secondary effects, and some of this is microbiome from the fermentation, changes in the pH, and again, uh, changing the bile acid. And we now know that the microbiome itself can affect uh, mood as well as energy uh, as well. So this can be, you know, affect the brain gut interaction as well. So we've heard about the low FODMAP diet shown here and the three steps that are involved with. And the reason I show you this, because I know Samita has already gone over it, is to introduce you to the next couple of slides. Now, uh, this slide just reviews the um, uh, network meta-analysis, just showing you that the low FODMAP diet is the most effective diet that we have available today. And this is and this shows you compared to other diets that have been studied. Now, two of the more recent studies just published, I'll review very quickly here. And this is the low FODMAP diet compared to um, a low carbohydrate diet or medical therapy, again, done in Sweden. So it was medical therapy based in Sweden. And as you can see on the right-hand side, that it was the low FODMAP, which is shown in red, to be more effective than the low carb diet, when certainly both of them being more effective than the medical therapy available in Sweden. Again, this is mostly over the counter medications uh, with it. And a study that was just recently published looks at the reintroduction phase. Remember the slide I showed you the three components, Samita went over it as well. And what and we really, most of our data has just been bit on the dietary, this four to six week strict diet. But really the question is, what do we reintroduce patients? How do we reintroduce and how effective it is? And this is really one of two studies now that have been published looking at the reintroduction. And what you can see on the right-hand side is that there are two food groups within the, within the FODMAPs, the mannitol group, as well as the fructans. And a subsequent study showed that the galactoligosaccharides and the fructans were the ones that caused the most symptoms. So really the fructans is what is showing and perhaps other groups like mannitol and maybe the galactoligosaccharides as well may be a contributor. So now let's focus a little bit on the drugs. Basically, we, as we talked about earlier, predominant symptoms, if diarrhea is your predominant symptom, then really the first line treatment should be loperamide. This is over the counter, it comes in two milligram tablets, and you can give up to eight per day. But in general, for chronic IBS, we're using lower doses, usually one to two tablets. And also it can be recommended that bile acid secretions be used particularly in a patient who's had a cholecystectomy, we know that's a higher risk for having bile acid diarrhea, or temporarily the symptoms got worse or started after a cholecystectomy. But even then, a short trial with a bile acid sequestion, one to two weeks is usually sufficient, is worth doing. If pain is predominant, then it's an antispasmodic, and this could be a prescription like hyoscyamine or a dicyclamine or uh, over-the-counter peppermint oil, uh, which can be effective. Then we move on to drugs, and here we're talking about rifaximin, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, such as amitriptyline or eloxadiline as a third-line agent, alosetron, which we won't spend much time going over in detail. This shows you the mechanism of action, which we'll spend a few seconds going over that. We know rifaximin is a minimally absorbed um, antibiotic uh, that's been shown to be effective in IBS with diarrhea, reducing both pain as well as bloating-type symptoms. And it's, But though uh, important to note that uh, symptoms do tend to come back, uh, with about two thirds of patients have a recurrence within, you know, 18 weeks uh, for it. But that does mean a, a fair number of people will have long-term effects. We know how bile acid sequestrants work. Loperamide works on the mu opioid receptor, um, and that slows down gut function. It doesn't reduce abdominal pain, but it does reduce urgency and frequency. Again, diarrhea-type symptoms. Antispasmodics either work directly on smooth muscle or through uh, calcium channel blockers, reducing spasm. Eloxadiline is a combination therapy, mu, delta, and kappa, uh, and alosetron is a 5-HT3 uh, antagonist for it. And then this shows you a network meta-analysis that puts it all together for the currently available treatments. You notice remosetron, that's a 5-HT3 antagonist available in Japan, not here in the United States, so I didn't mention it. But that's but as you can see, alosetron and remosetron, the two 5-HT3 antagonists, are probably most effective eloxadiline followed by rifaximin. And as the conclusion was, we found all drugs to be superior to placebo, alosetron, remosetron appeared to be the most effective. Some people have said, well, 5-HT3, we have a lot of them, like odansetron is commonly used for nausea. And that has been studied at high doses and can be effective at reducing bowel frequency, less so for abdominal pain uh, with it. Now we move on with patients that have persistent symptoms. We may go on to do other treatments like psychological therapies 
uh, et cetera. Um, before I talk about that, I do, I do want to talk about this one study done with low dose amitriptyline. We've already discussed this in detail, but this was a really nice study done in the primary care setting in the United, United Kingdom, where they had large number of patients that were randomized to either low dose that is 10 to 20 milligrams or increasing up to 20 milligrams and 30 milligrams, um, depending on tolerability and, and symptoms. And what you see is that um, after, the, after the treatment, uh, you can see the dramatic improvement that occurred uh, with the amitriptyline and not really worsening in constipation. Again, side effects were very similar between the two groups, so an important direct route. So then going on to behavioral therapy, uh, we already heard them these being discussed before, but I do want to mention a couple different things. One is that there are a number of digital therapeutics, and this is a really nice review uh, done um, in the American Journal of Gastroenterology uh, that by Bill Chase group, and you can see it went over the different type of apps that are available for hypnotherapy, and they're listed here, and cognitive behavioral therapy, both over-the-counter and prescription-based. And again, these have been shown to be effective in treating it. So to summarize, the guidelines, both by the American College and the AGA, has sort of reviewed the currently available treatments. And you can see here that most of them are four, um, being rec recommended four, but that is both uh, uh, FODMAPs, peppermint oil, uh, TCAs and gut hypnotherapy, and you'll notice that probiotics they're recommended against, and antispasmodics, even though I said they were effective, remember that there's only two available in the United States. They didn't feel there was enough data, and but the AGA did recommend on a conditional basis for them. Again, so that so this sort of summarizes it. So our ta take-home points are really to make a positive diagnosis based on symptoms, exclude alarm features, emphasize diet, lifestyle modifications, work with OTC medications first, line and then move on to the prescription the pain is predominant antispasmodics tcas and then of course psychological therapies can be quite effective so with that um, i like to move on to some cases first and then maybe we can uh, take some questions uh, towards the end and i think this is a good opportunity for our uh, presenters to come back on screen and then i can ask you questions and you can chime in as to how you might handle uh, these patients uh, so this is a 45-year-old uh, woman with recurrent abdominal pain, bloating, flatulence, and loose stools. So this sort of pretends the, the talk I gave, but I'm hoping you guys can help me out with it. So she's had a three-year history of recurrent uh, pain, uh, let most mainly left lower quadrant, cramping, bloating, flatulence, urgency uh, with loose stools. It began after an acute gastrointestinal illness, and I didn't talk about you about the pathophysiology, but we know that a GI infection is the major, or any inflammatory event is the major uh, trigger in patients. She has severe bloating with distension that's worse after eating, but no alarm features. Importantly, has had several close calls, but no episodes of fecal incontinence, and really has been very stressed about this and always looks for the nearest bathroom when out with friends. She's taken loperamide, a decreased urgency, but it worsened her abdominal pain, so she doesn't like to take it. And it did constipate her. Had labs that were normal. She does have some anxiety and depression, and not on treatment. Uh, she has had a cholecystectomy, but she exercises, eats a very healthy diet. Uh, BMI is shown here, and the rectal exam. There was no stool in the vault. Uh, squeeze and tone and relaxation appeared to be normal, so it didn't appear to have dysinertia. So to the um, Panelists, uh, what testing would you recommend? I thought we'd just focus here and and maybe, um, Scott, do you want to take the first stab at this? What would you do on this young woman? Scott, you're, you're muted. Um, can, I, can I just say, like, give, give a give a tricyclic and not do any further testing. Okay. Matt, do you want to comment? Then Sabino. Never disagree with anything Dr. Gabbard says, but you know, with the history that's been given so far, I think this is sort of concerning for post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. And I'd probably treat it as such. Like you said, there's no, there's no red flag signs. The labs have looked okay. I think it's reasonable in this patient to Pursue tricyclics, um, you know, just kind of going down the list, SIBO breath testing, 
we know the sensitivity and specificity of that is probably in the 70s. There can be false positives. There can be false negatives if you use lactulose or glucose, respectively. And often it's probably better idea to just expedite it and pre prescribe rifaximin if you're going to go that route. I agree with the tricyclic. I think it's going to improve abdominal pain, slow down bowel habits. I would probably pursue that with Dr. Gabbard, do a low FODMAP diet, ER and antispasmodics as well if the patient's looking for a few things to be done. Great. Dr. Gard, like any Yeah, I agree. Comment? The only thing I would add, I don't know if you mentioned this, Tony, is if she had celiac testing. Most of these patients with IBS, with bloating, diarrhea, there's some data to suggest that there might be a little bit overlap with um, gluten enteropathy. So I usually just make sure, I think you mentioned CBC, TSH, calprotectin, but um, I usually do gluten testing on these patients. Yeah. So. I, I, I went over the guide, some of the guidelines that would say, and, and Dr. Gabbard is not wrong, but, you know, just, uh, again, I probably would just do it all at once because I do try to follow the guidelines and I would check, I would do, uh, definitely check for uh, celiac disease with the TTG. Um, does anybody, in a, and if appropriate, I would do a stool calprotectin. That is if the stools are very loose. Stools generally need to be loose. And when I'm really concerned about IBD, it's a good way to distinguish uh, the two. Chiardia, if they've been a traveler, uh, if there's a risk factors, um, but if I'm going to do a stool study on them, you know, it's going to be for Giardia. We don't do SIBO testing regularly. Um, uh, do you guys want to comment on the serological test for IBS, the CDTP and the vinculin test that uh, is being marketed these days for IBS? Because it does help make, uh, may help make a diagnosis of IBS. I don't know if you want to comment, if anybody wants to comment on that. I'm not Tony, I say it's, it's not something I use in my practice. You know, when they've looked at the Rome 4 criteria, they said, if you diagnose someone with irritable bowel syndrome, there's a 90% chance that in 10 years, you're still going to have the correct diagnosis. And so I think going through the steps to evaluate and work up a patient like you've laid out, giving them a proactive diagnosis, I think that's probably the right steps. That's, these aren't something that I currently use when I see a patient with irritable bowel syndrome. Great. Okay. Let's move on. Um, so now we've already heard from Dr. Gabbard um, with this patient, but what would you recommend? And maybe it would just be good if you walked your way through each of the treatments, just so we can hear your thinking about, you know, whether it's effective in your practice and whether you use it often. And again, understanding that might not be the first line treatment, but I just want to hear your thoughts. So maybe uh, Scott, do you want to just walk through uh, each of the treatments? Um, sure. Yeah. So I mean. I think, you know, any patient who's had a history of a cholecystectomy, certainly reasonable to try a bile acid sequestrant for the diarrhea, not so much for pain. Um, in the absence of a cholecystectomy, I don't typically use bile acid sequestrants. Um, antispasmodics, again, can help with pain, not so much with diarrhea. The one caveat to that would be, you know, if a patient gets urgency before going out to a restaurant, you know, this lady, you could certainly, you know, do hyoscyamine for um, for that. Uh, rifaximin number needed to treat is about 11 or 12. So there are certain patients who are uh, reasonable to use, but number needed to treat is 11 or 12. Um, Eluxatiline, certainly for patients who've been through uh, all the therapies, same with the Losatron, if they've been through all the therapies, um, reasonable to consider. Um, behavioral therapy, uh, honestly, I would make that first line for all of our, everything we see if, if we had enough therapists, um, online therapy, if it's available and affordable for the patient, yes. And, um, amitriptyline, you know, for IBS with diarrhea number needed to treat is four. Um, you know, we use very low doses, 10 milligrams. Um, again, people say that's a physiologic dose for, you know, compared to depression, which was more of a 150 to 200 milligram dose. Um, so all the, you know, concerns about dementia were really more for the depression <laughs> doses much higher. Um, for, you know, a physiologic dose, I, I think it's um, safe, well tolerated and very effective. Great. And uh, maybe I just make a few comments as, in the interest of time. So. For eluxatiline, it's important to remember that um, 
it's not approved for patients who've had a cholecystectomy or drink excessive amount of alcohol. So just to be clear, this patient had had a cholecystectomy. So you really want to be careful because it can cause sphincter of OD, uh, dysfunction as well as um, pancreatitis. Alocitron is really uh, rarely used because it used to be on a restrictive program due to the ischemic colitis, which occurs about one in a thousand patients, and it can cause pretty significant constipation. So for that reason, it was third line on the on that algorithm. Uh, but I think that was a great, you know, an, an excellent overview. And I just want to emphasize this isn't the only list. This is just probably the most common one. There are lots of other treatments that we could talk about, and I'm, you know, as I mentioned, probiotics and other things that that uh, where they may not be generally recommended, but there may be times uh, that we would use them. And I, again, we can certainly this is not exhaustive, but certainly a place where we could start with it. So, in the interest of time, I want to move on to talk about a another person, another one with abdominal pain right, and constipation. So. She's had a 10 year history of hard, difficult to pass stool with bloating and abdominal pain. Strains to evacuate, rarely feels emptied completely. Bob movements every two to four days with some improvement of pain and bloating. Intermittently used PEG products, uh, has no alarm features. Um, and the question here again is the 35 year old, no alarm features, chronic symptoms for 10 years. Would you, what would you do? And again, maybe Matt, you could go through this. Why don't you just walk through the treatments in the interest of time, the the, uh, the test of the in interest of time, and give, tell us your thinking. Yeah, I think as long as you've got a patient that's up to date with their colon cancer screening appropriately and no rectal bleeding, you're probably okay to defer a colonoscopy. I see a lot of patients who say, you know, I had exactly the presentation of this. My doctor gave me a colonoscopy, told me everything was fine. I think it's important to recognize colon's a test of structure, not function. And we've got other ways to do that as well. I think gain rectal manometry with balloon expulsion is probably one of the first things I would recommend. Sort of a lot of things in the patient's history stuck out to me is his difficulty with evacuation, and I would I would absolutely sign them up for one of those. Um, I think I, I'm sort of on the fence about KUBs. Her history to me is pretty convincing that she's struggling with constipation. There's nothing wrong with getting a KUB and assessing for stool burden to see if. A patient like this may benefit from a bowel cleanse and then reinitiating a more effective laxative regimen after that. Again, SIBO with breast testing, there there's some evidence out there that methanogen overgrowth may may lead to constipation, but this isn't something I I think I would recommend for this patient. And then um, it's kind of a similar similar train of thought as far as breath testing for IMO as well. I don't I don't think I would evaluate the patient in that way right now. So Matt, just to be clear, for for this thirty five year old woman without rectal bleeding, with no family history, would you do a colonoscopy? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would say if anything comes up along the way and you start to have symptoms that may warrant it, let me know and we'll reconsider. But if she's below the age of screening, I wouldn't pursue a colonoscopy in her right now. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, Samita, do you want to um, walk us through some of the treatments that are listed here and 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 give us some of your thoughts on them and with and how they would apply to this patient who's 35 and has symptoms of incomplete evacuation. Sure. So it sounds like she's having, like you said, constipation with problems with evacuation. So a lot of times we do start with fiber, both dietary fiber and supplemental fiber, uh, mostly soluble fiber. Um, and I really go with the patient's symptoms. So if if they tolerate it, um, that's usually first line. Usually to that, I will add an osmotic laxative like Miralax um, to help with both stool form uh, and um, uh, frequency. Um, Senna and Bisacodal, I use more as needed. They're both stimulant laxatives. Um, I may or may not use on a regular basis. It depends on how severe. She's having bowel movements every two or three days. So she may not need a stimulant laxative. And then if some of these over-the-counter therapies aren't working, then we start to think about maintenance prescription therapies like the ones that I went over, the guanylate cyclate C medications, lin linaclotide, plac um, placanotide. Sometimes I see that tenapinor is a little bit stronger. Um, sometimes it can be harder to approve, so I may not use it as first line. Lubiprostone or amatiza associated in 10% of cases with nausea, vomiting, so Usually, I don't use that as first line prescription. Usually, I'll go with linaclotide or placanotide. 
Um, brucalopride or motegrity um, is a completely different mechanism. It can be used for both stomach emptying and colonic motility, but I do tell patients that there's a rare but notable side effect of uh, severe depression, suicidal ideation, and um, agitate, agitation, emotional instability. Actually, I just had a patient today I talked to about that. Um, most likely, this patient is someone that, as Matt said, needs anorectomanometry and will need anorectal biofeedback with uh, pelvic floor therapy. Um, amitriptyline, you just have to be aware that it is associated with constipation. Um, so I would start with, like I said, some of the over-the-counter therapies, fiber, Miralax, anorectal biofeedback before starting um, amitriptyline. And like Scott said nicely, almost all of our patients uh, probably first line would benefit from some kind of gut based um, uh, uh, um, psychological therapy. And if this patient uh, didn't want to, didn't have access to anorectal motility, uh, and you really suspected that this was dyssynergia and she had failed some treatments, would you send her, would you be okay sending it directly to biofeedback? Yeah, I think that's great. If if some some of the things that have come up before is insurance approval and um, getting it paid for, but if she's able to go without the interrupted manometry, I think that's great. Great, I think this is great. Thank you so much. And um, we're two minutes over, and I know there were a number of questions, and we and we're not going to be able to get to um, all of them. Um, maybe if I could take just a couple minutes um to to ask a few of them uh, so questions like for scott uh how long would you give empiric ppi therapy in a patient with dyspepsia i'd actually put um all my answers in underneath mm -hmm. oh thank for, you so for much most of them oh you're oh you're great so i was i was actually i was actually looking up the odds ratio for dementia and TCAs when you're presenting your first case, so I missed the whole cholecystectomy part. So um, I, my apologies, but the odds ratio for anyone who cares is 2.1 for TCAs and dementia. But again, that's all doses, not 10 of amitriptyline. Oh, great, yeah. So when I was presenting, I couldn't see the questions, the, the chat, because I was on full screen. So thank you, Scott, that's, that's fabulous. Uh, a couple other questions. Uh, regarding procalipride, any data on the use of procalipride in Parkinson's disease with concomitant gastroparesis and slow transit constipation? And um, any data on, well, why, why don't we start with that one? But Samita, I don't know if you want to take that. I'm not familiar with that specific population if there's any data. I don't know if you are, Tony, or anyone else in the group. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of any specific data. There may be small studies available. Uh, but I'm not, but I'm, I suspect the mechanism effectiveness would be similar. Um, it's a very difficult group to obviously um, to take care of. So another question, long-term effects of TCAs and other anticholinergics and dementia. And I don't know if anybody has seen that. That's or what I, odds ratio is 2.1. Oh, is that the odds ratio? Okay, great. Odds ratio is 2.1, but again, that's all doses, not the physiologic dose of 10 milligrams, right? So, so they're talking, you know, 150, you know, ish milligrams, odds ratio is 2.1. I mean, in general, you know, when you think about, you know, statistics in these retrospective studies, right? Odds ratio between one and two is more of a weak statistical association, not cause and effect. And I always tell patients, you know, the most famous use of this, to my knowledge, of you know odds ratios in these type of studies is when they proved smoking caused lung cancer. The odds ratio for that was ten. You know, obviously not everyone who gets you know who smokes gets lung cancer, but clearly there's cause and effect. So that was ten. So these studies that have an odds ratio in the high ones or you know two, again that's more of a weak statistical association, not true cause and effect, and we're giving a physiologic dose. Well, thank you so much, everyone, and uh, we're over our time. And I want to thank the audience, particularly for um, staying with us and for participating uh, in this uh, um, event, uh, event. If you join us for our next live from Cleveland Clinic program,
that's on October 9th, what's new in GERD therapies. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone and appreciate uh, the everyone's participation. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Lembo. You were fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, guys.